This episode of Paradigm Profiles is about the Impala Street Shootout. On April 4, 2003, I paroled from Corcoran State Prison and was finally discharging off parole. This was my second number and this would be the first time that I would be getting out of prison and would experience life as an adult without being on parole. I had caught my first number in 1989 which was an E268 number and before I could give this number back to CDC, I ended up picking up another case in 1996 and was then given a K135 number. During my entire adult life, I had become accustomed to dealing with parole officers, random parole searches, and parole violations. It became a regular way of life for me, and it was something that I had gotten used to. In some ways, it was actually good for me because parole kept me in check and had a big impact on how I would conduct some of my illegal activities over the years. Because I was on parole and because I knew that I was always subject to random parole searches, I never kept dope at the house, I never kept contraband at the house, and I always looked at my parole address as an extension of prison. Almost like my parole address was synonymous to a cell in prison. But things were going to be different for me now. I was no longer going to be on paper. I was no longer going to have to worry about dealing with parole officers, and I was just going to have some of the freedoms back that I didn't have while I was on parole. In the 80s and 90s, parole was a lot different than it is nowadays. Just trust me on that. Shit, even the parole officers seemed like they were different back then. There wasn't any flash violations. It was almost unheard of to do a 60 day violation and parole was a lot stricter. Almost every time I caught a parole violation, they used to hit me with nothing less than 10 months flat or a year. I'm serious, I never did a six month violation or anything less than 10 months. And because my controlling cases always involved violence, I always did flat time. 10 months meant 10 months, and a year was literally 365 days. If I added up all my violations I did on both my numbers together, I probably did somewhere close to 6 or 7 years worth of violations alone. When I left the prison in the early morning hours of April 4, 2003, I didn't even have to worry about any of the inconveniences of being on high control parole anymore. I didn't have to worry about my parole officer coming to pick me up or about being transferred to a prison closer to the location of my parole. This time, all they had to do was give me my $200 gate money, drive me to an Amtrak train station, and kick rocks. Prior to catching my last parole violation, I was living in Salinas and had been functioning in the Salinas Regiment. In fact, at that time, I was sent out there by NF leadership for the same purpose that I was sent out to San Jose for. Corny and Pinky sent me out there on special assignment to reestablish the Salinas Regiment. By 2002, I had close to 10 years of hands-on experience working in the street regiments, so this is why I was being bounced around and relocated to different areas to get these regiments back up and running. Leadership knew I was capable of accomplishing these assignments, and I guess they had a lot of confidence in me. So instead of catching the train and a Greyhound bus to Ukiah where I had planned on moving back to, I made plans to meet my late wife Vicky in Salinas to pick up what little property I had left out there. Vicky had managed to move most of my belongings back to Ukiah while I was locked up, but I had a couple guns out there and some other things that only I could get from the homies who had been safekeeping there for me. When I finally got to Salinas later on that evening, I met Vicky at a hotel and we decided to stay the night out there until I picked everything up the following morning. After I made my rounds and swooped everything up, we jumped on the freeway and made the six hour drive back to Ukiah. Although things had cooled down a lot by 2003, there were still a lot of things going on in the streets and I just decided that it was probably best to get out of Salinas. In 98, Mike Eel was murdered. In 99, Brown Bob was murdered. In 2001, Operation Black Widow was unsealed and the Raymond Sanchez Cap Saloon case was still in mid stride. People were still getting picked up on that case. They still had a lot of people under investigation. People that I would have been closely associated with and Salinas was just a huge melting pot of heat, indictments, and federal investigations. NF leadership was still housed at the Glenn Dyer Federal Detention Facility in Alameda County and the last remaining principal defendants were still basically waiting to be sentenced. After I took a few days to get myself situated, one of the first things I did was to find a trustworthy female visitor to go visit either Skip, Corny, or Pinky for the purpose of plugging back in with them. 
They had a general idea about when I was due to be touching back down, and I knew they'd be expecting this. This is something that I had to do every time I got out of prison. I either had to find a visitor to go pull one of them out, or to at least get word back to them that I was back out and was tapping back in. This is required by all active NF members. You have two weeks tops to take some R&R &R time with your family and then you were required to plug back in with your channel before it was assumed that you had either went AWOL or that you had abandoned your responsibilities and had basically jumped ship. When I finally did find someone who was willing to go pull Pinky out, I drove her out to Oakland and sat outside in the car while she went inside to relay my messages. Before sending her in, I went over all the things that I was expecting her to do for me. All she had to do was go in, pull Pinky out. When he came out, she was to introduce herself, let him know that she was there on behalf of Margie, my code name, and then she was to take out the kite that she had secreted in her mouth, unwrap it, and put it up to the window so he could read it. Then, if need be, she was to take out a small pencil that I sent her in with and write down any directives, filters, or responses that he had coming back out to me. Simple enough, right? So when she came back out about an hour later, she handed me the small piece of paper that she used to write my directives on and I started reading it. After reading it, I was a little disappointed to say the least. The message was clear. They wanted me to move out to Santa Clara County for the purpose of getting the San Jose Regiment reestablished and back up and on track. Pinky reminded me and reiterated that the majority of the regiment's leadership that included Ramiro Goose Garcia had all been indicted in Operation Black Widow and that the whole regiment had basically been told to disperse. Bad Boy and Chuco got snatched up in the Brown Bob homicide, Goose got indicted and was gone on another case, and Chico from Salinas was living in San Jose, got snatched up in the Operation Black Widow investigation. Any plans I had with Vicky about relocating to Ukiah would have to wait, at least until San Jose was reestablished. So my directives were clear cut and laid out. They wanted me to go out there, find and locate all the stragglers, get them all plugged back in, and get that regiment back up to the point to where it was productive. Once everything was up and running again, they wanted me to reassign a new COC chain of command and reestablish the regiment under my control. After accomplishing this, then I could either stay out there in San Jose and continue to head that regiment or move back to Ukiah and work on establishing another regiment in the Santa Rosa, Sonoma County area. I'll be honest, because of the NF's history in San Jose, I had no interest in moving out there. But unfortunately, this wasn't something that was open to debate. My intentions were to just move out there on a short term basis, get everything back up and running as fast as I could, and then get the fuck back out of Dodge. So within a month of receiving my directives, me and Vicky packed everything up, loaded everything in a 24 foot U-Haul, and drove out to Campbell, California. Campbell's a small city that's on the outskirts of San Jose. With the assistance of a close friend who I consider to be like a sister, Jennifer Lopez, AKA J-Lo, the wife of a fellow NF member, Bobby Silencio Lopez on death row, she helped me get into the same apartment complex she was living in in Campbell. I had no prior knowledge about Campbell, the area, the local street gangs, or any other type of helpful information before moving out there. It's not like I had time to do my own reconnaissance, so I was basically blind and didn't know nothing about that particular area I was moving to. Being that JLo was living out there with her two young girls, Andrea and Victoria, I assumed it was a safe area and that it was in a decent part of Campbell. But later, this would soon be disproven after I got settled into the apartment and got familiar with the area and the surrounding area. In fact, I'd find out that the next street over called Cadillac Drive, which ran parallel with Impala, was actually a Sureño stronghold and was considered to be in the heart of a neighborhood called BST, Barrio Sutrese. Barrio Sutrese is by far one of the biggest and most violent Sureño street gangs in Campbell, California. Since the gang's inception in the 1990s, some estimate that this gang has grown to well over 100 to 150 members. Some of the other more notable Sureño street gangs that operate in the Campbell and San Jose areas are VTG, Barrio Tammy Lee Gangsters, VCT, Barrio Colonias Trece, VST, Barrio Sutown, 
SSP, Su Santos Pride, and KVT, Kalmar Vagos Trece. There's a lot of other smaller subset Sureño gangs in San Jose, but these are the gangs that have established themselves out there and who have withstood the test of time. Now the following incident took place sometime between January and February 2004, during the time when I was operating an NF Street Regiment in San Jose. There's a lot of other things that happened during this same time frame that I'm not going to get into as this spill is supposed to be more about the Impala Drive shootout. For those of you who read my book, you're obviously going to see that I'm going to be skipping over a lot of other things that took place out there. But like I said, this is only because I want to focus exclusively on this one incident and I don't want to muddy the waters by getting into some of the other chaos that took place out there. Anyways, had I known what I'd eventually find out later about Impala and Cadillac, I definitely never would have moved to that area, especially anywhere near Cadillac Drive. Cadillac Drive was ground zero to one of the biggest Sureño street gang neighborhoods in Campbell, VST, Barrio Sutrese. So soon after I moved into that apartment, it didn't take long for me to figure out that I had moved right smack dab in the middle of that Sureño neighborhood. Whenever I'd come out of my apartment, I'd either see them driving by or walking up and down the street on Impala. And even though I knew these guys were Southsiders, I never said anything to them. And for the most part, they'd never say anything to me. Occasionally, there'd be a youngster who might walk by who tried to act like he wanted to test the waters. But whenever I'd see that, I really wouldn't even pay it no mind. Besides the incident I had on Impala, I'd only end up getting into it with these guys three other times during the entire 11 months that I was living out there in Campbell. I got into it with them one time that actually happened inside of a Safeway grocery store in Campbell. Damn, a mofo can't even buy groceries without getting ran up on. Then another time on the west side of San Jose that was just a chance encounter, spur of the moment type of thing. And then again at the San Jose flea market where I got stabbed in the hand and arm. And to all my south side brothers out there, let me just say this. I stopped gang banging almost 20 years ago. I stopped all that when I got into organized crime. I wasn't into all that when I was in my 30s. So all these situations with the exception of that one that happened on Impala were situations where I was basically forced to handle my business. Anyways, when J-Lo helped me get into this complex, I moved into one of the upstairs corner apartments and then I ended up renting another apartment right next door to it for the purpose of using it as a safe house. When I first moved out to Campbell, I didn't have any resources and I didn't know how to get in touch with any of the ends that I needed to. Luckily, J-Lo knew a lot of people and had most of the contacts that I needed. One individual in particular that she knew and that I needed to make contact with was, drum roll please, yours truly from a convict's perspective, William Flacco Vic from Milpitas. I had worked with this brother before in the past and I knew he was in touch with everybody. So I got his number from J-Lo and called him later that same day. When I called him and told him that I was living in Campbell and that I needed his assistance, he was literally there within 15 minutes. He showed up in a white Cadillac that belonged to his mom and we started driving around San Jose looking for the individuals that might have been functioning in the regiment. When Flacco got there, I explained exactly why I had relocated out there. Being that Flacco had been functioning in the San Jose regiment when Goose was there, he knew most of the manpower and how to get a hold of them. All, all I knew was that there were stragglers out there that had been functioning and that they were basically told to lay low after the regimental commander had gotten indicted. I only had one name of an individual who had been functioning, Isaac Gato Marquez, but I knew that if I could locate him, he could basically tell me everybody that I needed to locate out there. Flacco knew how to get in touch with Gato as his family owned a small liquor store in San Jose, so it wasn't gonna be hard to find him. But before we went out to talk to Gato, we were driving somewhere out on the east side when we ran into an individual named Richard Smiley Sanchez that Flacco claimed owed the regiment $1,500 for dope that was fronted to him. According to Flacco, I didn't know this individual, nor did I know anything about the debt, but I didn't have to. Flacco's word was good enough for me. When we seen this individual, he was just pulling up in front of his house, so I told Flacco to circle back and that we might as well jam this fool up and get the money right now. When we pulled up on this dude Smiley, he was just getting out of a blue BMW with his old lady. They had just barely parked in their driveway when we circled back. 
We both jumped out and I basically let Flacco do all the talking since he knew this guy. Flacco told Smiley that we were there to collect the debt that he owed and that he needed to take care of it or he was going to force us to deal with it our way. For the most part, I initially just listened and wanted to see what this dude was going to say for himself. But when he told Flacco that he didn't have the money and offered no other form of resolution, I told him we needed to take the conversation to his backyard. From watching this individual, I could tell this guy was already intimidated by my presence. He knew Flacco, but he didn't know who I was, and the tattoo on the back of my head is what had him spooked. The fact that we rolled up on him and caught him slipping in front of his house was one thing, but when I suggested that we move the conversation to his backyard, that's when I could tell he became visibly nervous. He probably thought we were going to take him back there and kill him. When we got Smiley in his backyard and told him that he needed to figure out a way to come out of pocket with $1,500, he claimed he didn't have it but could try to get it by the end of the week. I told him trying wasn't an option, that he was going to have to come up with the money by the end of the week and that there was no other alternatives. Otherwise, things were going to start happening that he wasn't going to like. Then I told him this money was fronted to him, that it was NF money and that I didn't care how he got it. If he had to rob a bank, then that's what he was going to have to do. Later on, this became one of my go-to policies. When some of the regimental members used to accumulate a debt or run up a bill through fronts, I'd give them a week to square up the debt and then after I'd make them rob a bank to get that money back. Although it might seem a little extreme to some people, this is what actually became the deterrent that would discourage them from going into debt. And this was dependent on how the debt was accumulated. If it was behind something such as them getting caught up with dope and catching the case, then I'd obviously work with them and help them square it up. But if it was behind negligence and being reckless, then they would be given one week to make it right. After that, they were going to have to do some John Dillinger shit. Because if this money wasn't collected and they drug their feet in getting it back to the bank, guess who became responsible for it? Yup, that's right, me. So if you didn't want to get put in that situation, then don't allow yourself to fall into debt. It was as simple as that. At that point, Smiley said he'd have the money by week's end. I was good with that, but I wanted collateral. A car, jewelry, computer equipment, anything of value that was equal to the debt or more expensive. Something that I knew he'd want back. They had a BMW I thought about taking, but they had young kids, and I wasn't about to leave them with no way to get around. After we started talking, Smiley told us that he was running a counterfeiting operation and could get the money together in no more than two days. Big mistake. I told him to take us in the house and show us his equipment. When we walked into his bedroom where he had everything set up, I told Flacco to start unplugging everything and to start loading everything up in the car. I took all his printers, his computer, all his templates, extra ink cartridges, and both partially printed and fully printed bills that were scattered on top of his dresser. Smiley was upset that we were obviously taking all his equipment, but there was really nothing he could do or say about it, and needless to say, his girl was livid. This was obvious by the sour look on her face, but this was something he brought on himself. I'm sure him and his girl got into an all-out bare-knuckle brawl when we left, but that was his problem. I told him that everything would be returned once his debt was paid, then me and Flacco left. Over the course of the next two weeks, Flacco was able to put me in touch with just about every individual who had been functioning in the regiment. After he put me in touch with Gato and another individual by the name of Larry Santos, the others would just follow soon one by one. Some of those individuals were Salvador Kojak Cecina, Jesse Conejo Rodriguez, Jose Largo Garcia, Gustavo Tavo Lua, Antonio Willow Fernandez, three brothers, Martin Sykes Martinez, Angel Young Buck Martinez, and William Billy Martinez, Marto Gonzalez, Eric Baby G Zarate, Vince Monster Terry, Patrick Turtle Martinez, Jeffrey Soldier Boy Orozco, Ronald Shorte Reed, Jerry Wessos Chavez, Lonnie Sniper Marquez, Isaac Gato Marquez, Arthur Ponyboy Hernandez, Joseph Atomi Abeda, and Jose Green Eyes Perez. After I moved into the apartment on Apollo and had tapped into all the manpower, I started breaking ground and began the building process. I'm going to fast forward all the way up until about February of 2004. 
Sometime around January of 2004, another apartment right next door to the one I was living in had opened up and was put on the market to be rented out. As soon as I found out it was available, I contacted the landlord and told him that I was interested in renting it. At the time, I had two purposes for wanting to rent it. One was to use it as a safe house to store some of the drugs and guns in, and the other reason was to use it to put up one of my regimental members that needed a place to stay. He was running from parole, his girl was pregnant, and I just wanted to put him up somewhere until she had the baby. Unfortunately, it didn't end up working out like that. On the night that I got into the actual shootout, he was arrested and taken in to do his parole violation. So by February 2004, I was working with an individual who went by the name of Don Julio. He was my meth connect. At the time, I didn't know it, but later on after we all got arrested, I found out that he was actually plugged in with the golf cartel. I just thought he, that he was a paisa with a shitload of dope. In fact, at one point, we were working so close together, and he got to the point of putting all his trust in me, he actually started safekeeping all his dope in the other apartment that I was using as a safe house. It worked out perfect, because I had free, unabridged access to as much dope as we needed. He started out keeping 10 to 15 pounds there, and then over the course of time, he brought his whole supply over there. An apartment he was using got raided, so he just brought everything over there to Impala. At one point, I counted close to 100 pounds, so there was some serious weight in there. When we first started safekeeping his dope there, the only thing that was there in that apartment was a small, dirty couch. That was it. Other than the dope that was kept in duffel bags and stored in one of the closets, there was nothing else in that apartment. When he started keeping his whole supply over there, he eventually started paying a paisa to stay in the apartment around the clock to watch over the dope. All this dude used to do was sleep on the couch and stay in the apartment all day. It wasn't that he didn't trust me. I think this cat just wanted another level of security to watch over his investment. So he started using this paisa to watch over his supply. It was around this time that I actually thought about taking all the dope and robbing this dude. It would have been like taking candy from a baby. The paisa that was staying in the apartment literally weighed about a buck 25 soaking wet. I would have just went in there and just suffocated this dude. It would have been that easy. Yeah, I know, I'm the Terminator. At the time I was thinking, damn, this was my meal ticket. Do the math, 100 pounds at 7,000 to 9,000 a pound at that time. And that's if I sold it in bulk. If I broke it down into small amounts, the figures would have been astronomical. If done right, it could have been close to 800K. The only reason I didn't get this cat is because I was thinking long term. And not only that, if I would have hit him for that much weight, I would have had to get the fuck out of San Jose. And this wasn't possible at the time. Hitting someone for an 800K lick like that would have pissed him off and it's probably safe to assume that this fool would have been on a warpath. Not only that, but my mistake was also letting Corny and Pinky know that I had this dude in pocket. And they had basically started to look at this dude as their connection. They kept emphasizing to keep a solid relationship with the dude and to keep things on the up and up because at one point we used him to network with Watsonville, San Jose, Salinas, San Francisco, and Oakland. I had plugged all these other regiments in with this cat so he was a huge investment. But what I did do was I started jacking him for two or three pounds every time the bison in the apartment would leave to go buy cigarettes down the street. As soon as he'd leave I'd tell my girl to go look out the front window and watch for him to come back. While she was keeping point, I'd take one of them small paper Dixie cups and then I'd grab two or three quart size Ziploc baggies, go in the apartment and I'd take a cup or a cup and a half out of each pound. By the time I went through every pound, I'd come out of there with two or three pounds of come up. So it would take me about a good solid eight months before I was able to get the San Jose Regiment back up and running. By February 2004, I had about 20 N's, bros, and C's working under me. I had invested in a legitimate limousine business. I was running a pretty elaborate counterfeiting operation where I was using degreaser to wash $5 bills and then I was reprinting 20, 50s, and 100s. We were getting off about 40 pounds a month between all of us and this was probably at the peak of everything. So one morning in February of 2004, I was getting ready to take Monster, one of my regimental members, down to the PG&E company so he could either pay his bill or get his service activated. Either way, we were getting ready to go down there. 
Monster was the one who I had staying in the apartment next to mine with this girl. That morning, when I was coming out of my apartment, a sureño from VST was passing in front of my complex and straight started gangbanging, throwing up his set and calling us out. At that time, I was 34. I stopped gangbanging in my 20s when I made a commitment to the NF. That just wasn't my thing anymore, but at the same time, I also felt like I had to teach this dude a lesson because of the way he was disrespecting us and that's all I was going to do. I wasn't even going to jump on the dude. All I was going to do was snatch him up, twist him up like a pretzel, and then let him go. But things didn't happen like that. When I came down the stairs from my apartment to shortstop this dude, Monster seen what was happening and came barreling across the grass until he was on top of this guy. Once he was on him, I ended up following suit. Not because I really wanted to jump on this cat, but more so because that was my boy. And if I'm with someone and they take flight, that's just what I'm always going to do. When it was all over and this dude took off running, I was actually mad at Monster and asked him why he did that shit in front of my apartment. Like I said, I wasn't even going to jump on the dude because it wasn't necessary. I was just going to put the fear of God in this boy. But now I was upset that it had happened the way it did because I knew that this cat knew where I lived and was definitely gonna come back. Right after this happened, we jumped in my truck and drove from Campbell to downtown San Jose where the PG&E company was at. As Soon as we got there, my girl called me crying, telling me that them cats had come back, that they had the apartment surrounded, and that there was about 10 of them outside throwing landscape-sized rocks through all the windows. I floored it and drove back as fast as I could, blowing through every red light and stop sign that I came up to. Meanwhile, as I was driving, Monster was on his cell phone calling everyone from the regiment and other ends that he knew, telling them to get over to my apartment because we were having issues with VST. When we got about a block away from my apartment, I told Monster that I had two bats in the back of my truck and that when we got there to grab the bats, then I told him to just follow me. If we ended up encountering them right there, that we just needed to make our way to my El Camino that was parked in the carport because I had a 38 revolver under the seat. Needless to say, when we got there, these cats were long gone. I looked up at my windows and every one of them was broken. When I ran up the stairs to check on my girl, she was still shaking up and crying and considering how many rocks they had thrown, it was a miracle that one didn't end up hitting her. There was rocks all over the floor, on my couch, on the tables, everywhere where these cats had thrown them. Within two or three minutes of us getting there, it was like half of fucking East Side San Jose had shown up. All the homeboys that Monster had called began arriving and they were all strapped. Altogether, about 30 homeboys showed up, but within 10 minutes, I told them all to leave because we were drawing too much attention and that somebody was gonna call the cops. Even though nothing happened and they all cut out without incident, it was still impressive how quick these homies assembled and it just felt cool knowing that they had my back like that. On the other hand, the apartment was trashed. I should have just got Vicky out of there, put her up in a hotel, or taken her back to stay with her mother until I finished dealing with all this. But I didn't do any of that. Instead, against my better judgment, I just replaced all the windows, I put 15 guns in our apartment, and then I had two of my regimental members, Willow and Angel, stay in the other apartment for the purpose of keeping security on the place. Then I put another 15 to 20 guns in the other apartment with them with clear instructions. If they come back, they can only come from the front or the side by my driveway. You guys get the side, I got the front. In retrospect, it was probably overkill. We didn't need that many guns, but I wanted to be ready for whatever might happen. The same day that these cats broke out all my windows, the connection, Julio, came by, came by later that day with about 10 other paisas and moved all his dope to another spot. I'm assuming he heard about what happened from the dude he had staying in the apartment to watch his dope. I never asked and at the time I really didn't give a fuck. My main concern at that time was just to deal with this dilemma that I knew I was going to have to deal with. I wasn't mad at him either. I understood and I probably would have done the same thing. There was no doubt in my mind that these dudes were definitely coming back. I knew it was inevitable. They broke out all my windows but that wasn't shit. This situation wasn't going away until they got their run backs for their homie that this all started over. Either that same night or the following day, Monster got snatched up and taken in on his parole violation. A few days before all this happened, Monster had been asking me to drive him and his girl to a self storage place on Old Oakland Road where they had been keeping all their furniture and clothes. 
Something told me that it wasn't a good idea to go that night. But this was one of the only times that I had time to do it, so we jumped in my truck and spun off. When we got to the corner of Old Oakland Road, where the storage place was located, I looked over and saw a monster hit the button on the side of the seat and slide back as if he had seen something that made him uncomfortable. He told me to look at this white van that was in the lane next to us and he said, look at this dude B, he looks like a fucking cop. When I looked over at the dude, I seen a middle aged white guy wearing a baseball cap staring straight ahead as if he was trying to sit real still. I looked closer and I seen a bucket on the passenger seat with a mop and some cleaning supplies in it. I guess he was trying to pass himself off as a janitor or something. It wasn't so much that this guy was white that made me suspicious, it was the way he was staring ahead not moving that was throwing me off. It was almost like he knew we were watching him through his peripheral. I told Monster just sit back, I'm gonna bust the left and see what he does. There were other cars at all four of the intersections but nothing else looked suspicious. As soon as I cut the wheel and made the left turn, every other car that was at that intersection either pulled up beside me, in front of me, or behind me. Then fools surrounded my truck and came out of every direction possible before I could even react. Monster was telling me to take off and go, but these guys were out of their vehicles and had their guns in our faces before I even had a chance to tell Monster that he was crazy for even saying that. If we would have had guns in my truck, some weight, or if he would have been running from a hot one, then I would have took off. But I wasn't about to go on a felony high speed chase in my truck with my plates over a parole violation. On top of that, I was a three striker too and his girl was eight months pregnant. Nah, little homie, you got to go ahead and knock out that little violation and take that one on the chin. After putting us on the ground, searching my truck and letting Monster say goodbye to his girl, they sent me on my way and let me go. I obviously didn't have no way of knowing it at the time, but the cop in the van that had slid right up next to us was actually a San Jose SWAT member named Ted T.J. Lewis, who would end up being the first one who came through my door when they would raid me about three months later. He'd also be one of two cops that would later spearhead the investigation of my regiment that led to the indictments. In fact, it was this incident and the shooting on Impala that triggered the bigger investigation that ultimately led to me getting raided. And the cool part about it is that I stumbled across a golden opportunity that basically tipped their hand and let me know that they were coming. It might not have avoided the inevitable, which was me eventually getting indicted, but if nothing more, I might have at least been able to delay it for a while. In a nutshell, this is what happened. The one thing about my second in command, Pony, that really began to become a problem is that he was never punctual when it came time to dropping off our re-up money. He collect the money from the manpower, but then when it came time for him to get that money to me, he was either always late or I couldn't get a hold of him. This started to affect my business relationship with Julio, my connection. So at one point, I began finding Pony whenever he was late or unreachable. On one particular occasion, I had been trying to get a hold of him all morning but he wasn't answering his phone. I kept blowing up his number all morning, but it just kept going to his voicemail. At some point, he finally answered, and when he did, I jumped all over his helmet. When I asked him why he hadn't dropped the money off and why he hadn't called me back, his exact words were, B, I found a bomb underneath my car, bro, and I didn't want to drive it over there. Because this was a reoccurring problem, and due to the fact that I had already fined him two or three times for this, I thought he was just offering up a lame excuse to justify being late again. I said, come on, Pony, are you really going to go to those extremes and feed me some bullshit about finding a bomb underneath your car? But he swore up and down that he was telling the truth. So I said, okay, it's all good. Come drop that money off and bring that bomb with you. I want to see it. So when he got to my apartment about 30 minutes later, he pulls up in his Bronco and tells me what happened. Pony was also a part-time mechanic, so he used to keep all his tools in the back of his Bronco. He told me that when he was cleaning up his Bronco, putting all his tools away, that he dropped a screwdriver on the floorboard, and that when he went to pick it up, it stuck to the floor as if it was magnetized. This made him look under the undercarriage of his Bronco, and this is when he found what he thought was a bomb. When he handed it to me, I looked at it and said, come on bro, this ain't no fucking bomb, what toolbox you pull this out of? 
As I began to inspect it closer, it was a small black box that was about three inches wide, six inches in length, and about an inch thick. There were eight high grade magnets on the underside so that it could be affixed to a metal surface like a car. And then a wire connected it to a smaller box that had four more magnets on its underside. I told Pony, this ain't no fucking bomb, bro. This looks like a GPS tracking device or something. At the time, I had an El Camino that was parked right there in the carport. And if for nothing else other than peace of mind, I walked over there and started feeling under the front bumper to see if I could find anything. Then I went to the back bumper, got about halfway across and felt something and pulled on it. That's when I knew it was definitely a GPS tracking device. I pulled another one off my El Camino, just like the one Pony found on his Bronco. I told Pony, these are fucking feds, bro. When I realized the gravity of the situation, I told Pony just like this. I said, listen, bro, if you want to go back to being a father to your kids or go back to doing whatever you were doing before you started working with me, this is your one opportunity to go. I'm not going to hold it against you. There's not going to be any consequences. This is your one opportunity to go. I even told him, if I was you, I'd take advantage of the opportunity and go. Because it's not a matter of if they're going to come, it's a matter of when they're going to come. Pony was just an NR member, so I could give him that pass. But I was stuck because I was an NF member and didn't have a choice. He looked back at me and said, I'm not going to leave you hanging like that, B. You're my boy. We're going to ride this out until the wheels fall off. I said, okay, but just remember, I gave you an out and you chose to stay. So what I did from that point is I had him take Polaroid pictures of these devices so that I could have my visitor show either Corny or Pinky what we found. This should have been a blessing in disguise, but that's not how it worked out. Before I continue on where I left off, I'm just going to say this. I always knew that we were all expendable in this lifestyle. And I was never in denial about that. I seen it happen to too many good dudes, so I knew better. When it comes to money, power, and politics, any one of us are expendable. And that goes from the top to the bottom or the bottom to the top. It can happen to any one of us, no matter how instrumental or how valuable we might think we are. I've never been foolish enough to think that any one of us are above it. But this was the first time in my 20 year run that I felt like he was being directed at me. When I had my visitor show Pinky the pictures of the GPS tracking devices, I was honestly expecting these brothers to tell me to lay low for a while, to crawl up under a rock and to shut everything down until it cooled back down. Knowing that we were being scrutinized and that we were obviously under an investigation, that should have been the only feasible thing to do. But that's not what happened. When my visitor came out and I read the reply, they instead said to just tighten everything up and be sure that all security and safety measures are in place. <laughs> in reality, they didn't give two shits about our security. I understood exactly what they were saying. Translation, keep the money coming. That's it. That's all. That's all they were concerned about. In the face of the fact that we were on the brink of getting wrapped up and taken down, all these cats cared about was making sure that their coffers continued to be replenished. We were basically fed to the sharks. Like I said, this was a blessing in disguise. And although it might not have stopped the inevitable, it might have at least delayed it if they would have cared about our best interests and told us to shut it all down. Coincidentally, two weeks later, Baby Joker from Watsonville called me and said he needed to come out to San Jose to relay something of the utmost importance that pertained to our security. When he came to my house to tell me what it was, almost a week later, it was to tell me that him and his second in command had both found GPS tracking devices under their vehicles. I couldn't believe it, but he was just as shocked when I showed him the pictures of ours and the response I got from leadership. This also confirmed that this wasn't a countywide investigation. It was definitely the feds. Anyways, after Monster got arrested, I told his girl Dulce that she was more than welcome to stay at the apartment and that I'd take care of her rent and everything else she needed until he came back home. I knew she wasn't going to stay there and that she was going to feel uncomfortable now that he was gone. But yet, I still made the offer. That same night he got arrested, Dulce's mom came by and picked her up. I helped her and her mom load up some of the things they had moved into the apartment and then they left. 
In retrospect, when I look back on everything that happened that night, I'm glad she did leave and that she didn't stay there because things could have actually ended up bad for her and she could have gotten hurt. So after Dulce left, I went to the other apartment and had a talk with both Angel and Willow. I just wanted to make sure that both of these guys understood their roles and why they were there. Both of them were not only NR members, they were also members of my regiment and they were there in that apartment for a reason, to keep security on the apartment. When I sat them down to talk to them, we went over all the details of what I expected from both of them. The plan was, was that they were both going to stay there for the next couple of days until I either got that visit or until I felt like things had basically cooled down. I never thought that these cats weren't going to come back or that this was just going to go away. I knew better, but I wasn't going to have these guys stay there for longer than a week either way. My directives were clear and concise. There was only two ways these guys could access my apartment if they came back, either from the front or through my driveway on the side. I could cover the front from my kitchen window, so I told them to cover the side. I told them, if they come back, chances are I'm not going to get the luxury of coming over here and letting you guys know. You'll probably end up hearing it kick off after the shooting starts. If that happens, I told them to come down the stairs and for one of them to swing around to the front of the complex and for the other one to go all the way around the back and then circle back so that they both meet somewhere in the driveway. The objective was to set up a two-way strike zone and then catch them on either side. That's if they tried creeping down my driveway. They both understood this plan and I gave them plenty of weapons to choose from. At that time I had accumulated over 60 different weapons for the regiment. Guns that I had my regimental members buy off the streets. Putting together an extensive gun cache was one of the first things I did. I told all of them that were out there getting their grind on, on the streets, that guns were our number one priority. If people came with guns and they wanted to trade for dope, to go ahead and buy them all up. So that's how I was able to accumulate all our weapons. We had AR-15s, Uzis, MAC-10s, AK-47s, SKSs, shotguns, bulletproof vests, infrared goggles, and every kind of handgun imaginable. When all this kicked off and I stationed Willow and Angel in the apartment next to mine, I pulled out about 30 guns that I had stashed in the other apartment and split them up between my apartment and the one they were already in. Like I said, I knew it was overkill, but I just wanted to be ready for whatever came our way. In my apartment, I literally put a gun on every table, nightstand, or end table. I also put guns on every windowsill and had a Mossberg 12 gauge shotgun leaning against the wall in front of my living room window. Later on that night, my second in command, Arthur Ponyboy Hernandez, came by to drop off some of the money that he had collected from the manpower earlier in the day. As we were sitting there in my living room counting out this money, Vicky was in our bedroom looking out our window. At the time, I really wasn't tripping on how this was all affecting her, but she was obviously still shaken up by what had taken place earlier. If I would have been paying closer attention to how this was all affecting her, I would have noticed that she was posted up on our bedroom window watching every car that was driving up and down the street. In fact, she actually came into the living room a couple times and told me that she watched a black Honda Civic drive up and down the street with his headlights out. The first time she told me I just wrote it off as if she was just tripping and being paranoid. But when she came back in the second time, I got up to see what she was talking about. When I looked out the window, I didn't see anything until I looked all the way down towards my left at the end of the street by Winchester Boulevard. I seen the black Honda she was talking about pull over on the other side of the street and then I seen someone get out and cross the street. It was already getting dark by this time so I couldn't really see anything until this individual started to get closer. As he got closer I was able to get a better look at this individual. It wasn't the same cat that this all started with. This was an older dude who was wearing a light gray hoodie pulled tightly over his head. When he got within 30 feet of my driveway, I slowly reached for the 357 Smith & Wesson that I had sitting on my kitchen table. At first, I didn't say nothing. I just stood there watching him, waiting to see what he was going to do. I could definitely tell that this individual was up to no good because when he got to the front of my driveway, he slowed down and started scanning the whole complex. At that point, I had seen enough. I slowly slid my window open and then I said, Hey bro, what's up? Who you looking for? As soon as I said that, I could tell that I startled him because he stopped, looked up, and said, Hey, what's up, homie? Where's all the homeboys at? 
I already had the 357 pointed in his direction, but as soon as he said that, I seen him try to pull something out of his hoodie pocket, and it looked like the hammer got caught up as he was trying to pull it out. That was my cue. I got off the first five rounds as fast as I could, but this fool was already shooting back, and his bullets were getting close. I'm just going to tell you like this. I used to take my guns out to the mountains when I was living in Sonoma County for target practice. And for the most part, I think I was a pretty good shot. But if you think about it, it's harder to shoot out of a window in a big open area than it is shooting up at a window into a box using the window frame as your target. Just trust me on that. Either there's some real truth to that or I just suck because this fool's bullet started whizzing past my head and I had to retreat. But as I started to run out of the kitchen into the living room, I got off the last three shots, shooting straight through my wall in the general direction where I knew he was. The common 357 has six shots, but this was an eight shot revolver, TRR-8. The whole incident lasted about three minutes, but after the shooting started, it was over that fast. I don't know how many of you have shot a 357 before, but those mofos are loud. I remember standing there for a minute after the shooting stopped and I couldn't hear shit. My ears were ringing. When my hearing did come back, the only thing I could hear was all the car alarms going off in the neighborhood. It was probably the concussion from the 357 that triggered all. When I ran from the kitchen to the living room, Vicky was laying flat on the floor crying and Pony was sitting in the same spot he was when I had left him there almost five minutes earlier. Seriously, this fool didn't even move. I remember him saying, damn B, you're a fool. I knew the cops were going to be coming any minute, so I pulled Vicky up off the floor, grabbed as much money as I could, and told Pony I was gone, and then I'd call him later. We left so fast that me and my girl both still had our house slippers on. I remember grabbing all the money from my safe, it was about 10 k but a lot of it was in small bills, so I was dropping it everywhere. Somebody definitely came up that night. Pony hit the front door about the same time I did, and as soon as the door swung open, I couldn't believe what I was looking at. Both Willow and Angel were squatting down outside my door with the dumbest looks on their faces. These cowards both pissed on themselves. Neither one of them did anything they were supposed to do. Instead, they dummied up and tried acting like they didn't know what the hell was going on. I was disappointed to say the least, but I'd deal with them later. As I was stepping past these two cats, I handed Angel the 357 and told him to keep his phone on and that I'd call him in a few minutes. As we were driving away from my apartment, a feeling of hopelessness washed over me. I knew I was going to be in trouble, but to what extent, I didn't know yet. I didn't know if somebody got hit, I didn't know if a stray had hit somebody else in the complex, and I knew the cops were on their way to my apartment and that they were going to find a shitload of contraband. My mind was already racing thinking ahead. I thought about driving Vicky up to Mendocino County where her mom lived. I had to separate myself from her, especially if I was going to start running. I thought about how I was going to continue running the regiment and just about all the things I was going to have to switch up. One thing's for sure, I could never return back to that apartment. I was going to have to get the homeboys together and have them move all my shit. But even that would have to wait for a few days because there was no doubt in my mind that the cops were going to be watching that apartment for at least another week. That night I drove to the Prune Yard Inn right down the street in Campbell. I figured tonight we'd just kick back and sleep on it. And by morning I should have a better idea of how much trouble I was in. As all this shit was going through my mind, I had completely overlooked and forgot about something that could have made everything ten times worse. It's like a light bulb went off. I still had guns and dope in the apartment. How the fuck did I forget about that? I had only been gone for about eight minutes since I left the apartment, but even then I thought it was already too late. So without much expectation, I dialed Angel's number and to my complete disbelief, this fool actually answered the phone on the second ring. I said, Angel, listen to me. I need you to go back in my apartment and get all the guns and dope out of there. The cops are gonna be there any minute he said, the door is already locked, B. I can't get back in. I told him, listen to me. Knock the fucking door down, fool. I don't care. That shit's going to get me in big trouble, bro. He said, okay, and got ready to hang up the phone. I said, no, 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 no. Angel, do not hang this phone up. That's a direct order. You hear me? I want to hear you get the guns out of there, and I want to hear you flush the dope down the toilet. I knew that if I didn't tell him that, 
that he'd hang up and never go back in that apartment. I knew this cat and I knew how he thought. So I made him keep me on the phone while he kicked the door in. I told him to yell for Willow so that he could help him and then I directed them to every gun in the apartment. To my amazement, they managed to get every last gun out of there and the cops still hadn't shown up yet. After Angel handed off the last gun to Willow, I told him to go back into the kitchen and get the ounce of heroin that was in one of the kitchen cabinets. Once he located it, I told him to go in the bathroom and then I wanted to hear him flush it. And that's exactly what he did. But no sooner than the dope went down the toilet, Campbell PD pulled up out front and started flashing their flashlights up at the windows. Once they seen all the broken glass and the bullet holes, it was a wrap. I was still on the phone with Angel when he told me that the cops were running up the stairs and when they started yelling through the open door. Angel said, B, they're at the front door. The only thing I could tell him was just shut the bathroom door and just be still. The last thing I heard Angel say is, B, they're at the bathroom door trying to get in. This fool was literally pushing on the door with the canine. The, the officer was pushing on the other side of the door and Angel was st still pushing against the door. At one point I hung up. There wasn't nothing else I could do. Unfortunately for Angel, he ended up getting arrested that night, but due to a lack of evidence, they ended up cutting him loose about two weeks later. I sat there in the front seat of my truck, imagining these cops searching my apartment and visualizing the whole thing. I somehow wanted to stop them, but there wasn't shit I could do. A few minutes later, I called Bobby's wife, J-Lo, who lived downstairs and tried to see if I could get her to stop them from searching. I was desperate, but I had to try to do something. I called her and the first thing she said was, B, where are you? These cops are all in your apartment and they got Angel cuffed up on the floor. I told her, Jay, I know, hey, do me a favor. I gotta get them out of my apartment before they start finding shit. I was worried about a stash of hot kites that I had hidden from all my visits with Corny, Skip, and Pinky. J-Lo's a trooper. She knew there wasn't shit she could do, but she tried. I heard her go up to the door and say, excuse me, do you guys have a search warrant? If not, you guys need to leave. <laughs> as soon as she said that, I heard one of the cops tell her, lady, if you don't get the fuck out of here, you're gonna go to jail. She said, okay and spun off. The next morning when I woke up, all I kept thinking about was how bad it was, how much trouble I was in. In the other apartment where I had Willow and Angel posted up in, I had a safe with about 40 ounces of crystal in it, bagged up and ready to go. Angel had managed to get all the guns out of my apartment, but there was no doubt in my mind that Willow had also gotten arrested because there's no way they didn't search both of those apartments. But just to be sure, I dialed Willow's number and what happened next almost caused me to fall out. This cat answered the phone. I said, where you at, bro? He said, I'm in the other apartment. There's no way. How could they not search it? I said, they didn't come in there and search? He said, nah, bro. They just came and asked everyone if anyone got hit. They did a quick cursory search and then they cut out. I couldn't believe it. I said, so you still got all the dope and all the guns? He said, yeah, bro. I even got a bunch of money that you dropped on the stairs. I was so happy that I wasn't even mad at either one of them anymore for pissing all over themselves and for leaving me hanging. I told him I was going to have Pony go by and pick everything up. About two weeks later, I had about five or six of the fellas go back and move everything out of the apartment. I never went back after that day. And that pretty much wraps up everything that happened that night. My time in Santa Clara County was pretty eventful. Those of you who read my book would know this already. I'd end up getting raided and indicted not too long after this shootout on Impala. This incident is ultimately what put them on my tracks. But even though I already covered a lot of this in my book, I'm going to go into a few other incidents in the near future like I've done here because the book doesn't go into as many details as I have here. I'll cover the Mikey Strider incident, my dealing with Peggy and Lynchell, the Chewy beatdown, and the actual day of my arrest. I hope you guys have enjoyed another episode of Paradigm Profiles. I know this was a long one, but I'm just saying though. I'll let you guys know what's coming out next, but in the meantime, thank you all, especially those of you who have been supporting us.